Um, so uh, we're going to talk, and then we'll, at the end, we'll throw some questions to the crowd. But uh, this is the amazing Sharon Horgan. Uh, you, you know from such things as uh, pulling, catastrophe, divorce, motherland, and you have two things coming out soon, Shining Veil, vale, or at the moment. Shining Veil's out at the moment. And yeah. uh, you've got Bad Sisters coming out on Apple TV, and you're also in my brother's film, I know. Dating Amber. So this is kind of, I just had to throw that out there. Um, and, is Lenny Abramson, who you will know from loads of amazing films. Uh, like Adam and Paul, Garage, what Richard did, Room, and then most recently, which is kind of what we're talking about today, delving into telly with normal people and conversations with friends. And the, we're kind of discussing today telly, Irish people and telly kind of generally, but if you just want to start talking about anything else, just go for it. So sure. um, I was going to start by asking you what telly you liked as kids yeah. and what made you want to make. So particularly because you made films for ages, Lenny. So I'm guessing you were focused on film and TV was the last thing from your mind. No, I was, I was a total, uh, like to the extent that you could be a, a television addict in the day when like RT1 began at, Five o'clock <laughs> in the afternoon and ended at nine o'clock, you know what I mean? But I used to get up on a Saturday morning and remember my father's face coming in because I'd close all the curtains and make loads of toast and wait for kids' TV to begin on a Saturday morning. So I definitely, a television was a big part of my growing up and I kind of, I loved everything, you know, all, lots of kids' stuff. But I also, I remember they used to show... Laurel and Hardy fil films and shorts, like in the mornings during school holidays, they just, you know, they just had this back catalogue of stuff they had the rights to, obviously. And then, so between Zorro and Champion <laughs> the Wonder Horse and whatever, <laughs> then you'd have... Yeah, exactly, exactly, my God. Um, <laughs> so I remember getting really into that, like, and, and that kind of odd slapstick stuff stayed with me, I think. But yeah, I was, I was a, a massive consumer of telly, not so much anymore, actually, but in my childhood, for sure. Um, Sharon, you kind of went straight into TV, unlike Lenny in the doldrums of film. Um, <laughs> what, what was, like, did you always wanted to make TV and did you always want to make comedy specifically or where did it come from? Like, um, when did you say... This I was is... trying to think of what my um, TV... What were your childhood pleasures in terms of Well, telling? I was a huge soap fan, like, you know, but Dynasty, Falcon Crest, Knott's Landing... Dallas. Yeah, I watched uh, all those too. Yeah. All of them. Um, but but comedy, because my dad was really into comedy, is really into comedy. So it was like uh, Rising Down, Porridge, um, you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, and then as I got older, kind of, you know, um, I suppose the young ones and French and Saunders. Yeah. And so I was, I was always a big comedy fan. And... You know, uh, like I'm, I'm from a family of five, so it was a way to sort of, you know, stand out by making your mum and dad laugh. But um, I, yeah, ending up in comedy, making comedy, I, I didn't think that would be my path. But it's sort of, I'm, it's sort of considered sort of lowbrow, I suppose, isn't it? I mean, not so much now, no. it's crossover, yeah, but, it's but like the half hour um, comedy wouldn't have been necessarily something that you would aspire to do. You'd be sort of aspiring to do what. What you did, you big I mean, highbrow snob, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing this is, is that good. It's, good. Keep, keep keep it's good. It's it's like it's a it's a fish out of water store. I can feel it. Um, <laughs> no, I think that you know, I actually love because I I am obsessed with half hour comedies. So I've always loved them, and it's funny. Yeah, so post all those kids shows, it was the same stuff that I that I loved, and I remember I even remember like because I'm a bit older watching Steptoe and Son. Oh, and, yeah. And that's, yeah. like, beautiful. A lot of that stuff is... I mean, those characters are exquisite and as good as any kind of iconic... Like, the, you can see all the Beckett and all oh, the... Completely. You know, there's all that yeah. stuff there. So, yeah, I, I, I think... It, so some of the, the snobbery around film, and you're right, you know, there, there is this... There was a, a time where you were either a film director or you were a TV director. Yeah. And they were not... They were not considered of equal standard, you know like proper directors didn't make television. Yeah, I remember you know? going to see um, 
So comedy, you weren't really allowed cross over into drama if you were in comedy, if that's how people sort of knew you. And I remember thinking, I'd quite like to do a bit of drama and going in to meet an agent at, I won't say the agency, and sitting down and sort of telling her that I was kind of interested in moving into that area and like her laughing, <laughs> you know, in my face because it just seemed like such a bizarre thing to suggest. You had to sort of do your time and then, you know, people like um, Ken Loach came along and put like stand-up comics in lead roles and they win the Palm d'Or or whatever it yeah. is. Or whatever, is that the name of the award? It is, yeah. I've, I've never been there. I'm not a high rank film person, but... Don't, don't tell me you've never been to <laughs> Cannes. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like people started doing it as a sort of, uh, you know, a, as a real sort of choice. And then it became like this thing. It was kind of cool to get comedy people that you wouldn't expect to get a real dramatic performance from. And now everyone's doing it. And there's, this, there's always this kind of insane, <laughs> that I find really stupid, but this kind of surprise that, you know, Bob Odenkirk is a really good dramatic oh, yeah. actor. Because oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. he was just a comedian before. But comedy acting's hard. Like, comedy hard acting is hard. The hardest. <laughs> and I agree. comedy writing is hard, the yeah. hardest. I mean, the thing about comedy, like, if, if, you're, <laughs> if you're making, like, you know, not to talk myself down, but if you're, if you're making a, a sort of, you know, an art house uh, low-budget film, for example, you, you, anything can be claimed as intentional, you know. So like, I know it's very slow and, and everybody felt a bit disconnected from that bit, but I kind of, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I meant, you know, that's what I meant. I, um, we're, we're questioning the very idea of, nar of a narrative being compelling. That's yeah. the whole point. Whereas but, if, but if it's comedy, if nobody laughs, nobody listen, laughs. If you, it's not even if nobody laughs. If it's not sort of moving at a yeah. pace. You know, with sitcom, you, you have like five or six sort of story threads because like traditionally you would, you know, it would often be ensemble and you would have to have lots and lots of different sort of themes and, and characters being serviced throughout, you know, oftentimes like 23 minutes. And so there's no room to do anything. You're just like moving from, and, 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 and yet it has to be satisfying. And yet it has to take you on an emotional journey and you've got to have a big old payoff at the end and everyone goes home happy. Yeah. You so don't have super, to make anyone have, happy. We have, like, it's, <laughs> we just... We just sit around yeah. scratching our chins all the time. Yeah. It's great. I mean, anyone could have made Adam and Paul. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, in fairness, that was sort of a comedy. Like, I, I was talking to somebody recently about, you know, because I, because I love comedy and because I have a huge regard for how difficult it is, um, and, uh, and, I, and I like making people laugh in life, um, people are always saying, you know, w would you ever not, like, make a, you know, I remember my son saying to me, the age, like, 12, you know, like in fairness, dad, uh, you know, your, your films are pretty boring. You know? <laughs> and uh, so, so people say, would you not, you know, I may come in. And actually, I would love to, but what happens to me when I start thinking about something is it always turns, it always turns left into yeah. that other territory. So Adam and Paul, there is lots of, I mean, it just, I love it's physical funny. comedy and yeah. I love the oddness and, and, and comedy can be deeply moving and beautiful and, and lots of the stuff that Sharon's done and, and, the, and like looking at things like Fleabag or whatever, they move effortlessly from kind of ridiculous to actually sublime. And that's a very hard thing to be able to do. When you were starting, so the first season of Pulling was 2006? Yeah. And then yeah. The f Adam, Adam and Paul was 2004. 2004. Oh. 2005. 2004. So oh, roughly right, kind right. of around the same time. That big divide that has kind of crumbled in recent years, was that still really there when you were doing those projects? Did you, was there a sense that film is over here, TV is over here, serious stuff is over here, comedy is over so here? So yeah, it was a double whammy really because yeah. even within drama, like, and it was true at that time, I think, that in film, the director had like, that was the person to whom the creative work was given, right? Um, in, but in television, it was much more a writer's medium and the director would come in sure, right. to deliver exactly on, on what was happening. You know, there was, a, there was a sort of house style and you'd come in and do it. And so there was a division. And then you're right, there was also that division between the serious and the comedic. That still exists, I think, more than the TV film divide, the comedy yeah. series divide yeah. still exists. And it's yeah. silly. But that director thing always blew my mind, you know, because I'm not sure if it feels like that in in UK or Irish TV, but when I went to the States first and saw that after the director had done his first cut, which he was given like three days to do, he's like booted out. Yeah, no <laughs> and then the showrunners come in and they go, right, let's fix this thing. Whereas, you know, it's, it, I, I just found that so bizarre and would always sort of think it has to go hand in hand. Otherwise, I don't know. Yeah, no, becomes. completely true. And 
and and and the 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 thing that's that that was always different in this part of the world. Like the American system is so brutal in that yeah. way. And I, thankfully, I've never been in that situation. I did one American show, but I was sort of like a producer on it as well, so I had right. more more yeah. control. But it is it is true. I mean, I think the other thing that's changed is with streaming and with this idea that like this, the conception was always like you go into a cinema and the sort of like you you've bu- there's this attentional capital like the person's paid their money and they've they've decided to go out for the night and they've got a babysitter or whatever so the, you've got them for sort of 10 minutes at the beginning and you can bring them into another way of watching and they whereas at home they've got the remote control in their hand and unless unless it's like flashbang whiz straight away they're going to they're gonna change turn, the channel but actually that's just not true people watch much more in a way people are more true? adventurous in what they watch on television than they are now in what they'll go to see in the cinema which is superhero movies so. i'm glad you say that's not true because i'm gonna quote you on that because that's <laughs> literally what's you know held over me as a as a threat kind of constantly it's like don't like keep it moving because people are just gonna sort of move on I think people are better than they think they are, or more open than they think mm. they are. When you started, was the, your Irishness significant? Like when you went and made pulling, were like, did it help or hinder being Irish? Irish accent is. Um, no, I don't think it sort of did either. Really, yeah. I, I, I suppose I, I didn't really um, sort of uh, em, sort of embrace what I had, sort of. Irish was until it came to catastrophe really and that's when I kind of brought in I thought you know I've got a lot to say here and there's um you know just bringing in the character sort of Irish family and and sort of just I don't know just embracing embracing the sort of Irish kind of in joke I suppose and but with catastrophe she was just you know in I suppose not with catastrophe with pulling in the same way that we didn't really not really think about them as, as sort of female characters. We just thought, here are some great characters. And we, she, we didn't really sort of, her, her, you know, where she was from wasn't really a, a part of it, you know. I mean, the only thing that made it stand out was the fact that it was three female leads and that was very unusual at the time. And how did you, like, originate projects then? Like, so a lot of your stuff, there's a kind of, like, pulling reflected a time in your life. And yeah. catastrophe reflects the time of your life. So were you often just starting things from, okay, what can I write about from my position now? I just really needed a job. Um, <laughs> that was it. That was literally it. Yeah. You know, we were lucky enough to have someone take a punt on us. And um, Dennis Kelly, who I wrote it with, we just felt, yeah, we that we had... You, what, you know, you're always best off writing about the thing that you know the best. It takes so long t- to write and sort of create a project, doesn't it? You need to really love it and feel like you've got something to say that's worth saying. And so that's all we had was our our, our disastrous sort of twenties and unsuccessful lives. Um, so yeah. Did you, and did you always want to be a writer? Because you're very much like you, you're producer, writer, and you're directing now as well. Like. I've re- heard interviews with you where you were saying, um, like, part of the thing with pulling is you just wanted to write a good character you could play because yeah. you weren't getting offered yeah. particularly good characters. Yeah, I mean, that's completely true. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still surprised that they let me. I sort of Trojan horsed myself into it, you know. I sort of like was here, here's a show, <laughs> just sort of like <laughs> climbing into it. And no one sort of noticed that I'd given myself yeah. the lead. There's so. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> Is there an alternative <laughs> universe where someone went, hold oh, on, yes, Sharon's in I it too. Oh God. Yeah, that's all it was. <laughs> what about yourself, Lenny? Because you a lot of like a lot of the stuff you've done has been adaptation stuff. Yeah. So how do you kind of well, the, and work the adaptation your way into thing it? wasn't like I never um I so the first two things I did were things with yeah. Mark, which were Adam and Paul and Garage, which were very much like small ideas that were expanded out. And then um I had read Sarah Ward's Little Stranger at that point and tried to get to do it, but hadn't quite made it because really I just didn't have enough stuff behind me. But that was the first kind of time I read something and thought, oh God, I can see that and that's really interesting and I'd love to try and work that into a film. But then I suppose that the, 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 what Richard did, which was the third film, actually, although it started with Kevin Powers' book, it actually ended up somewhere sort of completely different and it was it was devised with the actors and it was, that was, and Mal uh, Campbell, the writer, just all of us sitting in a room and talking about 
their lives and just working around this particular incident and one character from a what was in fact a multi-perspective novel. So that was a different process again. But so after that, um, and Frank wasn't, but then just room, I think, was the thing because that went well. And then you end up sometimes becoming, I can't say a victim of because it's been wonderful, but you do, you know, people recognize that there's something that you do or can do well. And then I kept saying, okay, well, I'm not going to do another one. And then all these really delicious things would come in. And it's really hard when you read something that compels you and you can see it. And, and also you're afraid of never working again, which is the other state that I think everybody so in, shit, we're it? always yeah. in that state. And it doesn't yeah. matter how well things go. I think it's always that fear. Um, so I ended up doing, you know, um, then I did the two Sally's, the two Sally Rooney novels and, but, but yeah, it's, so there have been an odd, and, and I've had this long and, and great relationship with Ed Guiney, the producer, um, and, and so much of the decisions have been sort of bound up in conversations that we've had and, uh, you know, so, so th that it's, a, it's, it, it, what I admire about y your stuff, Sharon, is just that you like took it absolutely by the scruff of the neck and then you, you did all the things that I think just empower you because you've set up your own production company and you develop stuff and you work with other people and, and you've basically sort of like pushed the walls away so that you've got a space that you can play in, which I presume in television is, one, is, is a very rare situation to be in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. You do have to be, um, you do have to be as pushy as you possibly can. And, and for that reason, it does feel a bit... Um, relentless, you know, and 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 I guess the choices that you make. I mean, I was going to ask you about that, like how, especially when you just come off the back of such such success in the film world. Like, how do you take yourself out of that and just choose to do, you know, a, a ten part series? Because I mean, I've just come off the back of making a ten part thing, and it's like taken me nearly three years. And yeah, it's is it is it harder. It, it is harder. I, I, I mean, there's differences, you know, but the difference for me, like on a film, it's one, one like, um, it's, I mean, just screen time's a lot shorter. Like even if it's a two hour film, normal people, six hours of television. Now I didn't do all of it, but I was across all of it as a producer as well. And very much involved in the adaptation. And, and actually you're looking at, we were lucky with that. It was a really unusual situation where, um, we, myself and Ed were really excited by the novel and we went to the BBC and said, what do you think? And they said, well, if you guys want to do it, if you get the rights, we'll green light it, which is a rare thing to happen. Yeah. Normally, you know, normally you have to go through this long process where you um, start doing treat tra treatments and drafts and get into this sort of long development process. And they said, no, th and that allowed us to go to Sally and say, you know, unlike anybody else who's coming to you, if we, get this novel we in a year's time we'll be shooting it so the brilliant thing about that was that it reduced three years to two years pretty wow. much which was great but it's still intense and and it's a sort of like there's a production line element to television no matter how authored it is you still like you have to be finished the offline on this episode because it needs to go into sound and sound needs to be doing this because yeah, they have to like be a finished it before factory, you, it's a, it? and, and that like at the other end of that if you're trying to keep something really delicate in the middle of that it's 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 very tiring but I think I did it because I've just been it, because because of this flip that you were sort of alluding to Patrick which is that television is now the place where I would say more interesting drama is happening on television than it is it's where in the a cinema. A lot of the stuff that would have been indie movies 20 years ago <laughs> exactly. I think, are being made as TV shows. And if we'd made Normal People as an indie movie, apart from the fact that you'd have had to curtail it and you couldn't have sort of respected the episodicness of it, like it fitted a television very well. But even if you'd cracked the adaptation as a film, I think it would have played in four or five cinemas in Dublin. It would have played in the IFI and the Lighthouse. It would have so traveled to, to yeah. London and done the BFI. And if you had yeah. lots, there would have been lots of, I think, positive criticism from the critics. And Sally Rooney, diehard Sally Rooney fans would have gone to see it. But like, it would have been a small independent film. And as it was, it like, it was the most recent figures we heard was like 60 million streams on the iPlayer in Britain. And it was like in, inconceivable that a film could have had that of that scale. Could have had that reach. Did that sell you on the TV concept? That definitely didn't do any harm. I'm just saying. It's like... 
<laughs> Did you know you were going to do conversations as well when you no. went? No. I'd actually said, I had said that I wasn't going to do conversations because they were, Element were developing it as a film initially. And oh, I couldn't wow. see it as a film. And, um, but after Normal People, and we all sort of said, you know what, it's really, this is how you do it with, with, with her sort of writing. And, and I'd enjoyed doing Normal People so much. Like I'd loved working with that cast. I loved working with, like just, just getting my head inside that generation of Irish people, which yeah. who live in a very different world to the one I grew up in. And I'm sure we all grew up in. But it's still so recognizable, it, really. Kind it, of, exactly. You feel it in your gut. And I, and I felt like I couldn't, I think in a way it was just I couldn't bear anybody else doing it. Yeah. And I felt like I really had to do the other one as well. So you mentioned that you have to be pushy in telly. So I was kind of wondering what you meant by that. But I'm also curious about how you think telly's changed since you made Pulling and what you can do, like Lenny was talking about, what you can do in TV now or what we call TV, everything streamed, yeah. um, that you couldn't necessarily do when um, you started. Well, I mean, yeah, there, there, I guess there's, um, there's a blurring of all sorts of lines, really. There's a blurring between, I guess, um, uh, what's seen as comedy and what's seen as drama. It used to be really cut and dried. Like if you made an hour length thing, it doesn't matter if it was funny, it was a drama. And if you made a half hour thing, it doesn't matter if it was not funny it was a, it I was a comedy sopranos recently and it was just like it's a comedy oh, it's, it's like it's so, it's yeah. a sitcom it's so funny. largely you know and the characters are comedy mm. characters but i mean it feels like there's a blurring of lines between um you know what's what is considered a us um kind of show or what's considered a uk show everything is very sort of you know it's made for a sort of universal market mm. isn't it because we all have our minds on everything is is a co-production now a lot of the time to get the money you know to make tv you you never have enough money to make tv they like open their little coin purse and go this, this much you go no how are we gonna make it for that much and they go well go and go and talk to you know the abc in australia or go and get some money from hbo and so you kind of have to tell stories in a in a way that um is just um uh, more palatable to a wider audience and and i guess the thing with that is is just still keeping stories sort of localized and small and you know in a way that they don't they're not trying to be too many things to too many people you know because then it just gets too broad and it becomes sort of you but that, know, that's sort of what is amazing about what's happened because there was a time when things did not travel the only things that traveled were dynasty falcon crest and you know yeah. big huge american glossy things travel you should do falcon crest yeah, we should uh, oh, that, i would love I that i mean it's UV. such a yeah. no-brainer yeah, isn't I, it? I, I can see the hair <laughs> yeah, it'd be yeah. amazing mm -hmm. um but the, the so the thing was like you would have um you know you'd have big glossy american stuff but the idea of, like a danish crime story or a, yeah. a small irish story or whatever but actually again all of these all of these kind of fixed ideas that were in the culture, which was that an American audience will never watch that. Yeah. I mean, that was, I would have, I believed that for years yeah. because that's what everybody was told. And then you suddenly go, actually, good stuff travels. And, yeah. and, and actually, the more specific it is to where it's from, the better. I know. I had a really funny conversation with an executive recently who was trying to, uh, uh, who asked me not to refer to, um, I think it was it was either Moon Pig or Funky Pigeon, or it sounds terrible, but it was just it, it made sense in in you know in the context, and just being like American audience is never going to understand that. I was like, who cares? Who cares Absolutely. for two words in a thing that you know? I mean, if you start doing that, if you start being so specific in particular, I think it'll you know it'll. Go you, badly. Yes. <laughs> are, are there differences like between say doing catastrophe was for aimed at a British audience initially anyway, yeah, or was it British aimed at both? Audience. Yeah, um, but but we had we had Amazon on board after we made the pilot. Yeah. So we made the pilot, you know, just assuming that it would um, air in 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 the UK and Ireland, and and then Amazon came on board. So we. You know, Rob Delaney's American, yeah. and we we had we had that sort of you know uh, a nod to that. But beyond that, we um, we didn't really think about it. We kind of thought if it's funny and it's good, it'll you know 
people everywhere will will watch it. Bad yeah. Sisters is coming soon, and that's yeah. Apple, so it's a yeah. streamer. That's and that's super that's, Irish. Yeah, that's the most like, Irish like, thing I've ever think, made. Is every Irish actor? Pretty or is much every. <laughs> Page. They're all in there. Yeah. Um. I mean, it was just an absolute joy and a pleasure getting and that's to do that. That's for an international that. audience. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It'll. It'll sort of. Yeah. Launch sort of world worldwide, I guess. But um. Yeah. But that's the first time I've ever just particularly, you know, thought. No, I. I really want it to be set here and um and just to to tap into that. It's actually a, an adaptation of um of a Belgian series. Ah, okay. So it, I mean it didn't it could have I guess could have been anywhere. So I, I just when I was pitching it to them I was like just did the whole hard sell for where it had to be Ireland. Why Scaries was so similar to some sort of Belgian town, right. sort of you know, aesthetically. I mean, yeah, showing right. pictures yeah. of Malahide. And they don't, they don't have a clue anyway, yeah. so it's fine. Just, yeah, just going, it'll all make sense. Um, do you think that would have been possible? Like, I'm guessing it wouldn't have been possible to aim at an international audience with something so Irish specific. I don't I think, no, think I, so. I, I a don't lot think so. tougher, right? Do you, do you think it was because the. Um, the do you think the execs then were right? In other words, do you think they an American audience, you know, it would have had to be on mainstream TV. It wouldn't have been on streamers. It would have yeah. been on ABC or something. Yeah. And probably most of the audience at that point would have gone, what am I watching? What are they saying? What are those accents oh, or whatever? completely. I mean, yeah. I, and, and they still do a bit. But, I mean, you just, it, it encourages people to lean in, I yeah, think. You know, sure. I mean, you, you start off just getting every single note you get back is, yeah. I don't understand <laughs> so-and-so. Yeah. Can we dub this? Like, accent. What's shifting? Can you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, exactly. <laughs> what do you mean, second ride? Like, what is that? But then you just go. It do, It doesn't matter. Like, just listen. Like, carefully. A little bit carefully. Normal people in conversation with friends are similarly very Irish yeah. focused, and they're for international. Yeah, we and we and, we had the same thing, which is that they were BBC, but then yeah. that'll never get you the distance. So we went and partnered with Hulu um, on normal people, and then again because we had a good time on conversations with friends. And we actually, funny enough, we did have that conversation with them early where we said, look, we're, we're not, if we, if we try and sort of, you know, tap dance here, if we try and kind of make it glossy and, and international, you'll lose the only thing that's really unusual about it, yeah. which is the sort of truthfulness of it and the detail and the low keyness of it. And they, they said, sure. And, and I thought, okay, that'll be fine. But as soon as they get the first cut of episode one we're going to get a million notes on accent and vocabulary but actually they didn't which was amazing where it did where it did where the notes did come was like episode one uh of normal people like it was the first five minutes of that episode and i don't i bet you it's the same for you it's always the beginning yeah. of the first episode oh god yeah and er, there is a, a a massive hysteria about the first five minutes of oh every... Oh, my God. It's, 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 it, it, it's, it's so it, true. It, 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 every, it's in the development process. No, every, this is when you've done it. Okay. It's all yeah. been there in the script and everything. Yeah. And then it's you been there it. for years. <laughs> it's been there for years. And then you get these notes That like, opening. I, I just wonder, like, maybe if you start with a kiss, like, it'll be that, it would be that. Like, what, you mean the first 10 seconds? Yeah, and then we can, like, flash back to find out how it happened because, <laughs> because that's the thing that will... They're terrified yeah. that the audience will go. Yeah. We yeah. really had to hold our nerve there and say, if you do that, then everybody is going to expect that level of incident all the way through the show. Yeah. And they'll be disappointed in minute 10, whereas if you start slow and trust that they'll lean in and they get interested in the characters, then their engagement will be so much stronger than it's going to be if you just, like, make it all noisy up front. Yeah. Know? So when you're kind of talking about it now, I'm kind of wondering, so there's obviously pros and cons to tell you now, but there seems to be a lot more pros than there were in terms of what you can get away with, what you can do. Yeah. Like, when you read it now, are you going, I can be way more experimental in this medium in the future and get away with it, possibly? Um, yeah, I think so, to a certain extent. I mean... I feel like you're still, um, you know, you can still bring new voices in. You can still, you know, introduce new talent and, you know, in a way that you couldn't possibly have done before. And so that's, I mean, that's experimental in itself, isn't it? It's sort of allowing people the, um, giving them the opportunity to, to tell new stories instead of always relying on the sort of old guard. I mean, that's why it took... TV so long to shift because you know the same jobs went to the same safe pairs of hands and have the, have the streamers opened that up more well I mean 
they they kind of have, yeah. It, or just the fact that so much content is needed. Yeah. I mean, you have to think outside the box because otherwise you will remain crewless and castless. You have to, Absolutely. and directorless. Yeah. You know, you, you have to start taking um, chances because there is a lot of um, TV being made. And I mean, the, nobody quite knows how long that's going to last, whether this is, you know, this, this massive, like, with news about Netflix and stuff, you go, well, maybe people will start pulling back. Yeah. But I think all that will do is m there will still be a desire for really good stuff. Like maybe maybe the volume of like 20 new shows every week, maybe that will go down. But I think, pe I think they recognize and it's finally got through that if it's original and good, people will watch it, which shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a massive, you know, learning moment yeah. really. But, but it kind of has been. And I mean, I think... For me, the thing that I found most amazing about the States, and I don't know if you, you found this, was like in Britain, with that one experience with BBC aside, there's just this, Britain and Ireland, there's this long, long process of persuading people that they should do your thing, yeah. right? And it go, people go around with the same scripts for years, and it just, and I remember the first time doing the pitching in the States and going, you know, two days, you do HBO, all of them, yeah. Amazon, you do them all. <laughs> And then you think, and then at the end of that week, you find out if anybody wants to make it. And if they do, then it's going to be made. And it was yeah. like, what, you mean you don't have to, I don't have to spend six months, you know, scratching my chin at home, worrying about <laughs> it. And it, it's that level. And that's somehow kind of that intensity of like that speed of it yeah. really is energizing. Is there a thing now, like you, I, you, your work and then there's like Ashling B's stuff, which, which you worked on as well. And there's Derry Girls and there's mm. the Young Offenders. There's like, there's a lot of Irish accented telly being made. Um, is that something that this country could be promoting and pushing more? The industries in this country? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, there isn't, there, there isn't, um, it, it, it's a budget thing as well. Yeah. It's like just yeah. sort of having... The, the money to do it. I mean, we've, we've um, made a, a few um, co-pros um, with RTE and, and you know, you, it, you, it's, there just isn't enough money there to, to do it. And I guess the, um, you know, then what you can do is do it as a, um, you know, sort of buy-ins, I suppose, and, and support that way where I, I don't know. I, I, you would, there's an awful lot of great talent coming out of, this country, a lot of amazing... And it tends to go to the UK. Yeah. It and, tends to sort of straddle a little bit, yeah. The way it is now here, it, like it's a choice, it, it's a decision or a lack of decision to fund RTE properly and actually to integrate RTE and the independent, like film and... T like RTE, it, it's quite dysfunctional in a lot of ways. I mean, and there's great people there, but there's ways in which it doesn't, doesn't work very well. And a lot of that you can sort of say is poli the fault of policy higher up the chain. But actually, if you if you look at all of this great work that's been made here, like all of the revenue that comes from yeah. it ends up in the UK and America. Mm. And that's entirely to do with the fact that nobody has gone, actually, you know, we could invest a bit more here and you could keep that process for longer in Ireland. And then, in other words, you can you can you can make the recipe and do the baking here, and then yeah, you can sell it all over the world, but it's still the ownership remains here, and I think it's a it's a it's a it's a shame that we don't we don't there, have that vision because there is so much being made here. I mean, I think half our special effects budget was used CGIing out other crews from other uh, yeah. shows. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's just yeah. constant totally. everywhere. Unit bases in the back of every <laughs> shot. It's like where are those white trucks coming from? Oh no. <laughs> Do you think there is like a bit of a, an Irish telly renaissance though with all the, the people I've mentioned and, and why is that happening now? And is that just because the streamers are more open to foreign accents and or, or what is going on? I mean, I suppose it is. I mean, they're, um, we're just very good at telling stories. And uh, I mean, from the point of view of like, personally speaking, Ashling and... Um, Lisa and you know any of the great sort of female Irish talent just wouldn't have got that opportunity like a few even five years ago you know I mean I've sort of said it a bunch of times but you know my big break was every other 
woman standing there with a <laughs> with a scripts, you know, um, um, bad luck because it was a sort of one in one out. You know, you got your sort of um, female. Um, we've got our female comedy. Thanks very much. And and so that's that's why why there's this big sort of surge of, of Irish female talent. My brother was saying when he was kind of shopping, dating Amber around, it was like, oh, we have a gay thing. Oh yeah, they already yeah. have a gay film. Yeah. We don't want. Yeah, one, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But um, we'll throw some questions to the audience if people have any questions. Just on the getting the TV shows off the ground and that kind of thing, with Merriman and your like histories behind you, like I've heard you speaking about how long it takes, and I've heard other people speaking about how long it takes to get things off the ground. I don't understand that, especially with such a, a huge amount of talent behind you and, and the work, body of works that you have. Why does it take so long? And just as a, just mentioning BBC and RTE, with having to beg and beg and beg and the state's just going, yeah, okay. Is it a state-owned thing and that they're just terrified to say yes to something because the governments are, you know, it's they're being funded partially by the states? Yeah, I, well, I, I don't fully know the answer to the second question. Maybe you'd have more of an idea, Lenny. But, I mean, in terms of why it takes so fucking long, it's just, it's just a, a lot of money to hand over I think and and they sort of need sort of assurances all along the way and that comes in the form of um you know you have to write a treatment for this show and with that treatment you've got to wait for a whole bunch of people to read that with a treat oh sorry a treatment a treatment is just where you sort of explain what the show is in a few pages you kind of go this is my idea this is you know my my thesis for the show um often it'll if it's a pitch it'll sort of tell you what will happen in the first episode and what will happen in the sub in the series and sometimes you have to say what will happen in the second series and here's a hint of what will happen in the third series because they don't want to commit to something unless they can see that it has legs and can sell and they can actually make some money from it so um you have to do that stage and then you get a a script green lit often it's changing a little bit now, but often you have to make a, a pilot, you know, a fully funded pilot of that show to show proof of concept because they're like, why would I give you 10 episodes worth of money? What if, you know, you, you could be talking through your arse? So you have to do that. That takes ages. It takes so long to, like Lenny was saying, you know, like the first 10 minutes of anything, it's the same with the script. It goes through so many stages and the same with the pilot and, um, all, I mean, that can take a year before you've even got your um, scripts green lit. And, and then, like, say, if you're writing 10, that's, a, that's, you know, another year's worth of work almost, even with a writer's room, because they've all got to get rewritten and signed off. And then you haven't even started filming and you go into pre-production and pre-production. If you're, um, you know, doing a, a 10 hours, it's, it's, it's 10 months, sometimes eight months, 10 months. And that's like, you know, three or four months worth of prep. Then you've got to edit the thing. And, you know, and sometimes it's a rolling edit, which means that the thing is being edited as it's sort of being prepared to go out so you know you get to see it first and then you're still working on the others but sometimes they want you to do the whole thing because it's going to be translated into 100 different languages and the marketing campaigns for each of those <laughs> yeah. um, series from you know Korea yeah. to wherever yeah. um, that all takes <laughs> And you, you, and you have two of those and out then, at the moment. And then they tell you we're going to put it all out in one night, and you're like, "Fuck you!" <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, what? Yeah. yeah, we're going to drop it on Sunday night at 10 p.m. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I agree, agree completely with what Sharon is saying. Like, even when you get to a point like where you have a track rec track record, the process itself just takes a long time. Even if people are inclined to like you because i know with sharon like there's no way that you would have the history of successful shows behind you they will want to commission it but they still have to go through their internal processes you know but just the actual doing of it and in a funny way like having all of that attention early does like it's like getting notes back sometimes um you resent notes are where the you know you'll show a script or a uh, cut to people and they'll come back and say well we like this but we don't like that have you thought about doing that and sometimes you get very you know you, it puts your back up a bit and you think you know, <laughs> yeah. who the fuck are you I've, <laughs> you know i've lived with this for you know 10 years you come over here and you tell me that i should and then actually after you calm down <laughs> quite often uh, even if they're not right about the specific of the note all they're really saying is that 
part doesn't quite True. work. Yeah. And quite often there's something to be said for having annoying people telling yeah. you that you can do it's a bit true. better. Like, it's you know, true. but, but it is, it, it's why when people say, you know, that what's the hardest thing for me, the hardest thing is deciding what I'm going to do next, because it, even though I can, now I'm developing things, multiple things. So not always just one at a time, still, it's going to be three years of my life on something. So it's like, yeah. Is that an important part of it, is having numbers of projects at different levels? Like, there's no way sure. you could do yeah. it if you didn't do it. Always, that, right? always. Yeah. And, and then it's when a few go at once. I mean, it's there's a terrible a thing to moan about, but you do have a heart attack. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what? Yeah, the only thing, sometimes the only thing worse than somebody saying no is somebody saying yes. Yeah. And yeah. then realizing yeah. that you actually have to do it. And I, I've, <laughs> I put down the phone. I, I had one, one time when I got um, a, a show picked up by a US network, and this was only to pilot, like they were, were going to make this, you know, as a um, half hour. And they, they all get on the phone because they're like giving you the good news. Everyone's together. We're all here. We're going to do, we're going to press the, the green, we're giving you the green light. Hey! And I was like, oh, yeah, this is brilliant. I put down the phone burst into tears <laughs> i was so yeah. upset <laughs> totally get that totally get that it is actually nowadays when you're thinking of projects are you thinking more of telly as of so having done i think there is so having talked a lot about television there is still something for me that like i absolutely am like at root really film is the thing that i'm most kind of connected to and that single arc story that's more that, that there's a level of kind of concentration that you can get into that if you th i mean whether that ends up in a in a theater anymore is the question it, it may still be on a streamer but it'll be a movie and it'll feel like a movie rather than a piece of television but so i having done two television series there is one other one that we're sort of thinking about and developing but i want to make a film before i do that and that's i'm writing something at the moment and i, I just yeah i still there's still something about that experience of going to a cinema particularly that I just love and making something for somebody in that dark room is there's a there's a thing that I I, I still get from that but but there's no I tell you the difference now is there's no hierarchy in terms of the it, it's not like film is there and TV is there they're just two quite different media and working towards one is a little different than working towards another but so it depends on what the idea is and it depends on, you know, what's what I feel at the time. But yeah, having done two TVs, I'd like to make a film. Um, is it the same for you? When you're thinking of projects now, do you do you have a bit of your brain that goes, that's a telly show, that's a yeah, film? Yeah, yeah. And how do you decide? Yeah, well, because I'm lucky enough to have um, Merman, I get to sort of do that a lot where people bring an idea or, you know, a book is suggested or even, you know, it's a story from a newspaper. You kind of, you, you get to sort of, you know, kickstart your imagination and, 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 and you can usually figure it out pretty quickly. You can usually tell which story seems to be something that would be told over six or ten or you know um or that seems like a limited series or that and then there's some that are just very very clearly films and you know um yeah so so for for me it's like I, I I've been filming for it's nearly 13 months like on set and uh and so I just need a break and <laughs> and sort of Is that on Bad Sisters that that was on Bad Sisters and then I I, oh, I had like about three weeks and I did this Jack Thorne thing just because it's like you were saying sometimes you just you just have to do it, do it. with um, with <laughs> Alison best interest with Alison yeah, wow. yes yeah. Yeah, from conversation. She, she loved it she loved doing it oh yeah she's an absolute dose so someone amazing. over there has a mic now um, yeah so mine is just picking up on a couple of things that Lenny said about how like people are more likely to sit down and watch TV. And you said about, like, say, normal people, if it had been made into a film, it would have been very indie, whereas it's so far reaching. Like, my 74-year-old dad watched Ordinary Folk, as he liked to call it. Uh, that's amazing. That's a much better title, by the way. Yeah, now we're on track. <laughs> but um, do you think that the pandemic has had a positive or a negative effect? Like, say, normal people came out at, like, the height so a lot of people were in and watching. Do you think that has had a positive effect on TV because people are more likely to sit down? Or do you think because so many things came out and we had so much choice during it, people are more likely to shop and change with what they're watching? Wow. It's really hard to say, I think, with the pandemic. I, I know, I think at that particular moment, you know, it was just an amazing uh, moment for something like normal people to come out 
because it is about intimacy and it, and I, and actually people were also just really at home then you know it yeah. wasn't even uh, and and all you all all that there was there apart from you know talking to your family which is obviously not going to happen was the television you know <laughs> yeah and uh so, so it, it really did have this and we I, I remember us all feeling sort of guilty because it felt like we were getting this huge kick <laughs> from this global catastrophe you know and i remember you wrote i think in a piece that the pandemic couldn't end until a uh, conversation with friends came out because <laughs> <laughs> it started with normal started people, with people. <laughs> yeah. um you know, it's really hard to say um, how it's affected things. I think it did provide these months and on and off where the fixation with what was being broadcast on television was just off the charts. And it's hard to know if that can happen during normal times. I think it can. Some shows just whatever just end up being this massive kind of moment, whether it's a normal week or, or something crazy like the pandemic is happening. Mm. I don't know. I mean, it feels like personally speaking, it's taken me a long time to start behaving like a normal human. You know, I mean, I like still a regular folk. Yeah, I'm still <laughs> like way less keen to go out and do things. So I think there, there's a sort of the, the the effect of the pandemic and being locked yeah. down and and sort of not being social has sort of stuck in us a little bit. So I think I think TV's going to be great for a while. <laughs> a while, yeah. I was just thrilled because um, I mean every. All, all the all the broadcasters were looking for stuff to go out. I mean, it was just, what can we put out there? And that's when everyone started making um, TV shows on their, you know, on their, yeah. on Zooms and stuff. But but Pulling had its a big sort of resurgence because of that. They, I've been asking for years for it to get um, repeated. No, I mean, it got shown to, you know, five people all those years ago <laughs> and was never repeated anywhere. And I kept every so often, I go... Why, why didn't you just repeat pulling? It's, it's a good show. And then finally, um, at the start of the pandemic, they, they were, <laughs> I was really happy about that. And loads more, <laughs> loads more people watched. I didn't make well. any money, by the way. It was just, <laughs> on, that, I mean, that's genuine. Because back then I didn't know what I was doing, but um, I was just so happy that people were watching it, you know, because so, that's all you want, right? Yeah, it's like sure. what you were saying about normal people just, it's just the fact that that many people look at your work. It's such a, I mean, it's uh, yeah, just a privilege. Hi, um, big fan of both yours. Um, and I've loads of questions, but I'm going to just try and keep it to one. Um, you said something about how, like when you were getting notes, Lenny, this for you, um, when you were getting notes back and they were going, change the beginning to make it like bright and sparkly. Um, and you went with the decision of like, no, I'm going to let people lean into this and let it build. For someone who's starting out working in film and television, is that nuance like something that you developed somewhere or learned somewhere? Or is it something that you just intuitively like decided to go with and picked up with over the course of your career? It's always, for me, it always feels like I'm stumbling towards something. It never feels like a kind of super, like, like there are times when you have a really clear picture of something tonally that absolutely and, and there's usually a moment in projects where that happens and then you're trying to hold that and you sort of lose it a bit and you're trying to yeah. work towards it but I, I think yeah there is a degree I suppose of of experience where before you might have listened to that note and gone well maybe I'm wrong maybe people will turn off but I actually sort of believe people would turn off uh, just to clarify what I said but I just didn't think there was any other way of making it our belief with normal people was that it was going to have a decent but pretty specialized sort of audience, even on even on the streaming platform, because it was so low key and relatively slow, and and because you know, okay, people are going to wonder what's going on in the first three minutes and switch it off. So we were, it actually was it was a better result than we thought, but we still all knew enough to know that if we try and sort of you know do a big dance at the beginning of this, it will sort of fall on its face. But but I also, I also think for anybody who's like a filmmaker, of, you know, television or film, um, what I've learned over the years about notes is that the, your best bet is like it's it's like judo or something. You have to you have to like you have to sort of go. Oh, that's really interesting. You have to use their momentum 
to kind of knock yeah. them over. If you, if, you, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you go back and say, well, I think that's a ridiculous idea, then everybody's on the defensive immediately. You just say that in emails to your very to close you, and, and working contact. And try not contact. to put it in by mistake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's um, I think it's partly just in you to begin with. It's your intuition of of what is the right way to tell the story. But I feel like when I started out, we had this sort of arrogance of 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 youth, sort of, and and we sort of didn't give a shit. Um, we just thought this is what we think is funny. This is what, how we want to tell it, and we weren't sort of thinking about a kind of wider audience and who's pleased. We're sort of pleasing ourselves, which is both good and bad. And I think now, over the years, I've become a like I do want to uh, appeal to a, a wider audience. I do, and I feel like like you're saying, there's a way to do it where you really, really retain what it is that makes it special, makes it yours, but just like opens it up just a little bit more. So. Yeah, I send a lot of angry emails and then I sort of do a version of the note. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you do it anyway, it's great. <laughs> you, with Merman and kind of working with other people on their stuff, like you talked about, I, I don't know how serious to take this, but you didn't make much money on pulling because you didn't know what you were doing back then, right? <laughs> Is it very important for you to, when you're working with... I guess, like you worked with Ashley B on This Way Up or whatever, that you bring the things you've learned about how the industry can screw with people's uh, work. And well, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess I sort of, anytime I, I work with any creative, I try and sort of, you know, go through the, the pitfalls kind of thing. It kind of happens naturally as you sort of, as you work with someone, but, but also at the same time, everyone just has to, do it their way. I mean, you can give your sort of advice on on how you think someone should build their so career. You're giving the note that people are emailing their friends about. Well, I mean, <laughs> sometimes I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's yeah. absolutely true. I'm sure I have done that for sure. Like, especially if on the those bigger adaptations where you're working with a group of writers and you're giving notes back to to a group of writers, and you know there will be people sitting in various parts of the oh. city. Absolutely. Shaking their heads and thinking, oh, Jesus. You know, <laughs> but but it's always for it's usually for a good reason. You try and do it like generously and not nastily. But yeah, like I don't think Connell should have a gold chain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, 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 exactly. I, I think what what I How dare what, you. <laughs> one one thing I've learned to do is to uh, reread my emails. Yeah, you know because sometimes you can write such a angry yeah. thing. And, and, you know, it's because you care so much about what it is you're doing. Just reread the email and, <laughs> yeah. and it can say the same yeah. thing. Oh, I just, just have to remove you fucker. Yeah. It, it reads fine. <laughs> just like take some of the anger out of it because everyone, like I've sort of learned to really appreciate everyone's, what everyone does on a, on a, on a, on a TV show or a film, like everyone has feelings <laughs> and everyone, yeah. you know, wants to be appreciated and, 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 you know, it's just, I've also, learned to do things in a slightly different Everybody way. wants to think, nobody wants really to be responsible for something being bad, right? So yeah. one of the great gifts, one of the great insights I remember having was people want to believe you know what you're doing. So if you go and you say, look, I totally see your, your worry here. here I think there's a different way of fixing it, or I'm very aware yeah. of it. And just when they feel the doctorly sort of, the hand, the, the sort of back rub hand of, what they really want to be able to, go, to do is go, I hand it over to you and it will be okay. <laughs> yeah. So actually they really do want to give you control, I think. Yeah, yeah. Un unless there are, you do meet sometimes people who are very controlling in a, in a sort of, you just wonder what that's about. But generally yeah. speaking, you know, <laughs> um, generally speaking, people want you to take the responsibility from yeah. them. It's like a way of taking the baby, you know, and they, they're they sort of worried about handing it over. But as soon as there's a comfort to them giving that responsibility <laughs> to somebody else, you know, you can kind of use that against. It's great. I think we'll have time for one more question. I think we've kind of run out of time otherwise, but... Yeah, sorry. You spoke about the kind of bureaucracy and jumping through groups of making a TV show. Uh, is it different for making films? And uh, if so, do you think it's uh, likely to change with the kind of big streaming platforms? Is that do you reckon it's going to be that process is going to be shortened or adapted to make it easier for filmmakers, or is it going to, 
Is it going to hand more control to the street and plant? I mean, it really depends. I think generally I've been happily had very good experiences making films. Um, and and in, in films, there's more of a sort of conversation about the same final cut where like somebody will have in television, it, that's that always really exists with studio, doesn't it? It's like ultimately, but I've never had an argument with, with the in, in the television experience I've had. I've never had to do something that I didn't want to do. So there's always usually a way of getting to agreement, but in the film world, actually, uh, like, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very director focused in, in a way, which is great for, for me. And I've been very lucky that, um, the one time I had a sort of, there was a real difference of opinion. I did have final cut and that allowed the conversations to be extremely friendly because it didn't ever feel like, you know, I wasn't ever going to be in a situation where I'd be locked out of the cutting room or whatever, that wasn't going to happen. So. Uh, I think as of now, probably there are the, the note process is probably, but listen, I don't know. I don't make big superhero movies. I'm sure if you do that, they are absolutely all over you. If there's a $200 million budget or something, yes. but on a reasonable budgeted feature film, it's, it, it tends to be quite civilized, I think, and less, probably less noty than television. Yeah. I mean, I've only had one experience, which was when we, we produced uh, or co-produced um, um, herself with Element. And um, I mean, that was kind of a, a joy. I mean, it's like anything. It sort of took a very long time to get it moving. And then when it moved, it moved like lightning. And um, but, you know, the film we're, we're um, producing at the moment, it's sort of been five years and you know for various different reasons it it seems like longer than tv and a lot of those sort of film war stories i hear are you know seven ten years yeah. sometimes you know because it's all about like you know if it's a decent budget you gotta get a big name in it and big names tend to just sort of not read things for years or they will you know take on something else and then you gotta wait for them to come to come free, it's sort of, it feels like it has a different sort of, um, what you call it? Like, it's just, it, it, there's different reasons for it to not move, yeah. right? And just to stall. But in terms of like, you know, the, the notes process and, and, and how much they can sort of shape your movie, I think it's like Benny says, it depends on what you've worked out with them beforehand and, and who you make it with, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, for sure. That's, that's the, for me, the biggest, like I, I haven't thankfully had a lot, I haven't had one of those things happen in film um it they've they've all been pretty civilized and and like it's been a good experience but i think that's because internally like with working with ed and uh who we choose to partner with and and actually not looking you know trying to structure things so you don't have to have the massive piece of casting that you know and just making it so that it's makeable in on your terms and then and choosing projects that you know you can make for the money that you can probably get for them and so there are ways that you can hedge against that kind of horrible process but i you know maybe i'll be here in two years time wheeled in having been beaten around for you know 18 months so i don't know maybe it will happen but i think i've been lucky so far i'm here thanks a million everyone for coming and thanks a million to lenny and jerry Thank you.